Emily J. Well, Delighted to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming over here to talk about a subject dear to my heart, dear mm-hmm. to your heart. You spent a little more time thinking about this <laughs> than I have. Maybe I too just much. use this as a big session for you to help me I answer think all of my dilemmas. That's the most fun <laughs> way to approach this. So. Yes. Well, we're both parents of four kids uh, of differing ages. And um, this book is fantastic because not only is it about the health of, of the children that we're all trying to raise as effectively as possible. It's about paying attention to our own well-being in this equation. How dare you write a book about yes. making sure that the parents are happy? Right. We are supposed to put all of our, our energy and self and everything into our children, right? Mm-hmm. Until we're bleeding and we're, we're left laying on the side of the road. Yeah, uh, for them to walk carcass. over and... Yes. yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. and ride to their next appointment or something. No, it is it is crazy how, as a society, how much we're feeling that right now, that it's our job to put, um, to, to sort of sacrifice ourselves and our well-being and our time and our energy and our money and all of our resources are supposed to go straight into our children who, I don't know, are presumably supposed to somehow grow up and commit the same exact cycle for their kids? I don't know. One of the questions I like to ask people is, well, if your kid's life looks just like yours when they're your age, will you be thrilled? Mm. And if the answer is yes, then, you know, I mean, I guess basically carry on. But if there are things where you're like, well, uh, you know, I, I, I was kind of thinking she spends a lot of time playing the violin now. It, it'd be nice if she were still enjoying that. Um, and I've lost mine. I don't know. It wouldn't, it's, an, it's an interesting sort of but the, thought the, exercise. But the kind of gut reaction that I would imagine a lot of people have to that thought is, well, I'm doing all of this so that they can have a better life, so that they don't do what I'm doing. Like I'm trying to instill in them or provide them with everything that they can have so that they can transcend the circumstances that I'm in to live differently and better. I think we get to do that for ourselves, too. And I think for our kids, I mean, if we need to put this all onto our kids, you know, if we sort of need to put make them the focus of what we're doing and why we're doing it, it's actually much better for them um, to see the adults in their lives having a a productive, happy, pleasant, uh, joyful experience. Otherwise, how are they going to learn? to do that. And why would they even want to? I mean, sometimes I definitely look at my kid's life and go, man, I would like it if somebody just drove me around all the time and like clapped when I did fun things. That would be great. (laughs) Um, It's somehow not how things have worked out. Maybe my mom could come and she could drive. (laughs) Yeah. I don't think that's That's going to work out so well, but it's, it's really, this is like, this is our time, right? We've got 20 plus years of raising our families and being with them and being all together in that same house and and sort of having this experience of being a family. I just want us to make it great for everybody. Yeah. I mean, just hearing you say that and simply by virtue of the fact that you wrote this book makes me feel better. <laughs> but it But it also... I can't help but also feel like I've been like a little bit of... I, there's that little bit of like guilt... You know, that creeps up like you're a bad parent if you're not if you're not giving over all of yourself for the betterment of your kids. You know what I mean? And maybe that's a social programming that we need to transcend and overcome. Well, I think it's social programming. So let's let's look at like um, let's uh, we'll go ahead. We'll take it from the kids perspective. So one of my mantras is that you can be happy when your kids are not. And that definitely makes some people kind of go. Yeah, it makes people nervous. Little, you know, little step back there. Wait. No, I can't. I can only be as happy as my unhappiest kid, right? That's the saying. I can't be happy when they're not. But um, you know, let's sort of let's let's talk this. Let's let's parse this out. So, if you're the kid and things are going wrong for you, you know, like you didn't get invited to the birthday party and you're 11, and your mom is losing her mind because you didn't get invited to the birthday party. A couple of things are happening. First of all, you're like, whoa, maybe this is a big deal. I mean, I was thinking it was an 11-year-old birthday party, but maybe it's huge. Secondly, 
our kids don't actually want us to be unhappy. I mean, all right, sometimes it feels like they do, especially at two mm. o'clock in the morning or whatever, but they really don't. Uh, so here's your child going, mm, when I tell my mom that things like that happen, she gets really upset. Maybe I shouldn't tell her. Or, oh, my dad got really, you know, like when I didn't make the team, it really freaked him out. So maybe like, maybe I should, maybe I should either pretend it doesn't matter to me or not try out because... Like, I don't like to upset my parents. Yeah. So those are some unintentional consequences that they are feeling. Plus, um, you know, our kids don't need the burden of our happiness on top of theirs. That's the bigger point, right? Yes. I think, you know, having that kind of extreme emotional reaction to that situation, uh, even if it's well-intended, is only sort of putting... Um, you're just, you're just adding to the, the yeah. problem. You're amplifying something. Yeah, and like you carry that into adult life. I mean, if you're 35 and getting a divorce, then things aren't going great for you. You don't also need your father to be falling apart mm -hmm. because you're getting a divorce. Like, you don't, you know, you want to be able to go, okay, I'm having a mess right now, but, you know, my parents are, they're okay. They're at their even keel and I can look to them and I can, I can go to them. I mean, and that's true when you're very young too. You, you want, you want to be like, oh, I'm having this crazy emotional teenage thing, but my parents, oh, you know, they got a tennis game. I mean, they're here for me. They're empathetic. They're sympathetic. You know, they're trying to help, but also they're showing me like that there's going to be a life past my crazy teenage experience. And that, you know, also that my family is here for me in a different way, that they're not sort of all wrapped up in whether or not I get the lead in the play or not. Yeah. I mean, there's some something just fundamentally very unhealthy about a parent who is overly emotionally invested in the vicissitudes of their child's yeah. daily emotional interior life. Yeah. You know, there has to be a healthy boundary between that. And, and, you know, Julie, my wife's been great about this. Like I've learned, I've learned from her when our, when our kids were younger, if something is upsetting our child or, or, or you know, the, the, a child is pitching a fit over something or something like that to just not buy in, just be like, okay, I, I see you're really upset, but to be completely, um, unfettered by right. that. I think demonstrates like a strength or a level of stability that is a buffer. Like if you buy into that mania, then you're just, you're accelerating this yep. whole process. It's, there's something really unhealthy about you're that. You're feeding the beast. Yes, exactly. Is what you're doing. And then they're taking your emotions and they're gobbling them up and then they're feeding back to you and you're gobbling them up and everything just, I'm you know raising my hands here, but everything just goes up and up and up to this other level. Um, we call that, you don't have to go in there mm -hmm. in our house because one of our kids used to have her tantrums in a closet. We and we yeah. would just we would literally okay, stand outside out. the when closet. When you're done, yeah. dinner's ready for you. Pretty right. much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We would stand out there looking at each other, going, "Are you going in there? I'm going in there." And eventually, it just became. And you know what? We're not supposed to go in there. It's it's better because we, you know, I mean, this is not like I know all the things. This is more. Um, I've talked to a lot of experts. I've done a lot of research, and I've got a fair, you know, I've got some experience, and all of that is piled into this book. And you know, that was one where. We used to go in there, you know, we used to sort of throw ourselves right in with it and either try to fix it or yell because why are you getting so upset over this stupid thing? Or, you know, just there's sort of a lot of different reactions that you can have yeah. to a kid well, who's it, upset. That feels like you're parenting. Yeah. That, right. Yeah. It feels like you're doing something. But you're and, actually working at cross purposes. Right. Sometimes nothing is the best something. Right. So let's take a step back. I mean, why? Why write this book? Like, what? In, I mean, you were you've been a columnist for the New York Times for or many years leading up to the point mm -hmm. of writing this book, um, writing about parenting, writing about well being in the family for mother load, and then it became well family, right? right? Like you rebranded it. Uh, what inspired you to 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 even write this book? From well, I wanted to go. I wanted to go deeper into our experience than you can go in like a series of 800 to 1,000 word um, pieces. And it really started with, you know, I, I've written a lot. I've written more about the societal and the cultural and the policy parts of parenting, you know, sort of the reasons that, that these are, the reasons that things are hard um, 
or that we perceive things as being hard when they're not. And some of the reasons that things are objectively difficult. I mean, you know, realistically, we talk a really great game in this country about how we're all about family, Mm -hmm. but it's really hard to find daycare. And, you know, if you have a baby and you have a job, those are two things that are not necessarily compatible. Um, You know, and yet we expect you to do it. And that's, I mean, that's sort of a really, it's a different conversation. So, Mm um, I thought about writing about that, but that has been written about and, and really, you know, brilliantly by people that I respect. Um, and I just kept sort of thinking, well, I'm a part of this movement to try to change both the policy that impacts families and also the way that we talk about family and the way that we support them. But that's not going to, honestly, it's not going to help me. We can get all the family leave that we want. That ship has sailed for me and for many of my fellow parenting. So what I wanted, or fellow parents, what I wanted to talk about is like, how can we make our day to day better right now with the cards that we're dealt with the fact that soccer is insane and you know your your school expects you to be doing kumon and violin class thinks that you're going to play the cd over and over in the car until your head explodes like how can we sort of take and the Susie world we down live the street in? is always doing it better oh Susie down the street yeah. let's don't even get into Susie down the street uh-huh. i mean the way she's kids got her kids in their trapeze classes and all that yeah. stuff it just makes me crazy Right. Um, well, what I what I really kind of like love and appreciate, you know, about the kind of core theme of this book, which it, which really boils down to um, this idea that that you can't take care of others unless you take care of yourself first, mm-hmm. which flies in the face of like our instincts, especially as parents, to kind of sacrifice ourselves for the for the betterment of our loved ones. But it really is true. Like you have to tend to your own garden. You have to put that oxygen mask on first before you put it on the child. Right. That has just become such a saying that we've sort of, I feel like we've started to just kind of give it lip service. Like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, I'm taking care of myself. I I eat healthy. You know, I go to a couple of exercise classes. But, um, you know, to really have you know, to really model a great and full life for our kids and also to just have it for ourselves because we, you know, we are, we are worthy of putting time into ourselves and making our own decisions about like sort of how we want to spend Saturday and where we want to go for vacation and even what we want to have for dinner. It doesn't have to revolve around somebody else. You know, whether that's your kids or your parents or, or, or anything, or I'm sorry, your parents, your partner, um, or anything. I, it's just, I feel like, um, you know, I talked to this, this great expert, Rick Hansen, you probably know him. Um, he's the neuropsychologist. He's the author of, um, Hardwired for Happiness. Mm -hmm. And he's written a lot about how, you know, human brains are really kind of they're wired to look for the bad stuff, right? Because bad stuff is dangerous. I mean, we got to look for those tigers. We got to remember where the tigers are. Um, and he's, his idea is that the more time we spend soaking in like the good stuff, the more we can train our brains not to freak out about imaginary tigers because there aren't that many. Mm -hmm. But the point, the reason I'm sort of telling that story is that at some point he said to me, you know, sometimes I feel like Americans are afraid to be happy. And that really soaked in for me. Like, I don't want to be afraid to be happy. I want to, I want to, I want to go for it. I want to like grab all the happy that I can. And that doesn't mean you know, everybody else out of my way. I'm going to get my own happy. It, it means, um, uh, you know, let's, let's build something that, that's wonderful yeah. for all of us. Where do you think that fear of unhappiness comes from? Well, we really, um, you know, we, we kind of, we don't think it's worth our attention, Right, I mean, being happy. How is that productive? Towards, I know, and we're supposed you know. to be like you know the the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But how is happiness productive? How is happiness improving the economy? How is happiness improving the political situation or the you know the the suffering of, of other human beings? Like I don't know. I think um, I feel like we we really. We, again, it's a sort of one of those ideas we give, we give some words indulgence. to it, but then we see it as an indulgence. It's that same thing mm-hmm. that keeps us from taking all of our vacation time mm-hmm. um, or from really shutting our computers down at night and, and actually doing something instead of sitting there with your email in front of, the, in front of you and you know, Netflix on the TV and, and sort of half working and half watching. Yeah. Well, there's the, the theoretical aspect of what you're saying, which I think we can all kind of 
agree with, yeah, I get that. Like I need to be happy and blah, blah, blah. And then there's the practical implementation yep. of trying to make this happen. Uh, and so I'm just imagining somebody listening to this. Okay. Yeah, I get it. But like, I have two jobs and I've got kids that go to different schools and carpool and soccer practice. And by the time, you know, I get home and then I got to make dinner, like I'm depleted, I'm exhausted. It's literally just a race to the finish line each night so I can crash and repeat the cycle once again. Right. So how and, do we break yeah. out of this? That that is exactly the thing. So I mean, you know, when I when I hear it that way, that's that's the experience that I sort of started from when well, I didn't have two jobs. I only had the one job, the one paying job. Um but that's where I think that's where a lot of us start is sort of we get up in the morning and we lace up our skates and we start to go and we run all day and then we get to the end and we just sort of collapse into bed. And if we've got a partner, we start arguing them, with them about, you know, whose day sucked more mm -hmm. because, you know, that's that's what we're seeing around us. So I have a bunch of answers for that. And one of them is it's just this question of, of why we're running so hard and where we're running to. Um, you know, we've really, we fill our days, like we fill our kids' days or they fill their own days because there's really, I mean, there, there's so much great stuff. Like I want to do all the great things. Mm -hmm. I want to learn to surf and, and learn to draw cartoons and take violin lessons and do, but um, you can't, you can't do all the things. And sometimes we get a little caught up in the idea that we can, you know, that we can, um, it's not, you know, we can we have should, it all. And that we should, yeah. And that really. we should, or that we should provide our kids the opportunity to, to do all the things. But what we're forgetting then is that we actually really both want and value and need time to do none of the things. Um, this is like, this is sort of part of my whole, um, get more sleep, have happier mornings, mm -hmm. uh, make everything slow down. But a lot, a lot, a lot comes back to the idea of protecting playtime, downtime, and family time for our kids and for ourselves. Because a lot of what we forget when we schedule all the, all the, all the, mag and it is magnificence. Like it really is fun. It's great that we can give our kids tutors after school to, to help them grow and, and, you know, that they can be in an, or sometimes they have to be in an after school program because we, you know, we're still at work, but then afterwards we feel like, well, we can still get them to football practice. You know, we don't want right. them to miss out on that. Um, God forbid, God, you know, God half forbid. an hour of free time. Yeah, exactly. So what we forget is that we, we really, we want and we crave and we need that free time. And a lot of the time we take that free time and we suck it out of our sleep. And then we get more unhappy because then the next day we get up mm -hmm. and we didn't get enough sleep. And the whole cycle just starts all over again. Yeah. We're in this culture in which we feel compelled to schedule our children to the hilt <laughs> and that we're a bad parent if we don't do so. And we've lost the art of doing nothing and the beauty and appreciation uh, for just free time, for yeah. play time, uh, because it provokes something inside of us that makes us feel like we're not doing a good job well, if we're we scared. allow for that. We're scared. And it's not unreasonable because, um, you know, when you look at your kids and, and sort of the world that they're going to go in, out into, what is, there's, there are some numbers out there that I don't remember that some huge percentage of the jobs our kids will have are jobs that don't even exist yet. Mm -hmm. So how can we possibly prepare them for that? Um, college applications are a totally different, like whatever, I don't know what your experience was in applying for college, but I can tell you your children's will not be that. No, of course uh, it's not. Completely I mean, the, different. the world is changing the world so is rapidly changing. right now. We're dealing with an incredibly antiquated educational system. We don't know what things are going to look like in 20 years. Uh, I'm not sure that we're adequately preparing kids for this futuristic world that, you know, exceeds our ability to comprehend with the right. advent of AI. Like I just did a podcast with Yuval Noah Harari, and he said the most, he's like, our education system is broken. The most important thing um, to teach and to learn is emotional and professional flexibility. Mm -hmm. To like be able to um, have incredible interpersonal skills to be able to like ride the wave of change by being 
resilient. Right. And so multiple thousands of parents just heard that and thought, where can I get a class in, in resilient <laughs> yeah. schools? Because we want to control. Yes, yeah. because we want to control that. Okay, if that's the mm-hmm. most important thing, I want to make sure my kids learn it. And unfortunately, a lot of what our, our kids are going to need to know is how to make decisions for themselves, how to decide you know, how to decide for themselves how to spend their time, how to find something that they can get into deeply and and you know sort of focus on and concentrate on and instead of giving them the opportunity to explore um, and the space to explore and the time sort of dope around and do do nothing, we want to fill their time with with structured activities that are going to make sure that they've at least learned something. Um, I mean, I get that. I don't want to, I don't want to sound like and my kids are all, you know, out blowing dandelions right now. They're, they're not, I don't know what time it is exactly, but they're at, uh, you know, various practices and, and sort of things yeah, of that sort. I, I mean, a lot of that is being motivated by fear, right? Yes. That fear that somebody else is getting ahead or they mm-hmm. will be un- unprepared or that you're not measuring up yeah. as a parent. This is or the one like class that. or the one test that's going to make the difference. And, you know, my special snowflake is going to, yeah. you know, get into the drift that gets into the Ivy League versus the drift that doesn't. Um, and, and on the, the yeah. snowflake thing is a big thing, too. I mean, we're so terrified of them being hurt or injured because we are generally afraid. I mean, when I was a kid, look, it was a different time, granted. But, you know, I just – in the summer, I got on my bike in the morning and left and came yeah. home at dinner. My parents dropped me off at the neighborhood pool, and I just hung out all day, and I came home at night. Right. This You're not even allowed to do that anymore. Yeah. And I, ha- I think it's a crime, actually, in some <laughs> it's places. It's terrible. You know, yeah. if you're unsupervised. Um, and I don't know how I feel about that. Like, I understand we need to be... Um, well, and if you are that parent, your kids', is, your, your, your kids as friends probably aren't. So, you know, you have the yeah. only kid riding around the neighborhood right. on their bike while everybody... And this is... It's a problem. I mean, it's, it's really hard. We're sort of all um, sort of psyching each other up together. It's hard to fight against this. I don't, you know, I don't want to pretend that this is, that it's easy to say, well, you know, we're going to step back and we're going to try to, to prioritize you know, happiness and balance when everybody else is kind of like doing what's called the rug race, rug right. rat race. But if we can agree that it's important to instill in our children a sense of independence and a sense of self-sovereignty, and self-confidence, we have to relent. Like we have to take yep. a step back and provide some modicum of freedom and decision making on their behalf, which I think is is scary on some level for a lot of parents. Especially because a lot of parents then say, "Well, all my kid's going to do with that is like get on their phone or be, play video games." Mm. Um, you know, maybe that's true. Right. And so, how do we do that <laughs> responsibly? Um, you know, I honestly think that. We kind of, they need actually enough time to get bored with those things. Mm. And that is really hard. I, yeah. the, you know, now, I don't now know that they yeah. can, there is no boredom anymore. Mm. I don't know. Don't, you know, it, if you, if you, if you have like, if you have hours every day that are available to you to do whatever you want um, as a kid, you're, you're going to spend some of them on your electronics and mm-hmm. on your screens and, and on and, and all that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if anyone's willing to do this experiment, but I, I eventually those things get old. You know, yeah. kids start looking around for other things. I mean, am I am I giving my kids that opportunity? Sometimes yes. Sometimes now. You know, am I going upstairs and saying stop playing Fortnite now? Um, yes, I absolutely am. But. Uh, yeah, it's you, you. We have to sort of, we have to give them the space. Like when we were kids, we for us it was TV. Like how much TV? Yeah. And so some parents were like, no TV. You know, my kid watches no TV. And some parents were like, an hour a day. And some parents were like, go for it. All the love boats you can watch right. you know, or whatever. And then you have, you know, A-list Hollywood directors talking about how they were latch kid keys yeah. and just watch television all day long. And right. now they're, you know, making massive movies in Hollywood. So it's, it's not a simple, it's you know, really, linear equation. It's really, really not. And I think, 
you know, we have to take some risks. We have to, to accept that when we say to our kids, well, you know, you can do whatever you want on Sunday, but I'm going to, you know, schedule the heck out of you on Saturday or whatever, that they're not going to spend Sunday in ways that are what we would choose for them. That's the mm-hmm. whole point. They need to learn to choose for themselves. Yeah, I think one of the, the differentiating things between television and, and screens is, I mean, beyond the obvious that it's a supercomputer that can do many more things. It's more active than passive compared to television. But it is the device by which the younger generation not only communicates with each other, as do we as adults, but, but it, is the, it, is, it is really the way that they're going to make their way in the world. Like, they have to be fluent right. in the language of these mm-hmm. devices. So the solution isn't, like, remove it. No. Um, I know with my, with my younger kids, it would take a very long time for them to get bored and say, okay, I'm done with the screen. I'm, I want to go do something else. Like, it's so addictive. It's so compelling. Um, but if you restrict that time and say, okay, now you're off, suddenly they're painting or drawing right. or going outside, things that they're, they're not inclined to naturally choose on their own when they have this screen in front of them. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is a compelling option. I feel like when, when kids are littler, when they're younger, you really have to, you know, the, the adult needs to be in control of it. The thing is that as they get older and they start, you know, becoming teenagers and getting into high school, we need to start relaxing our control while talking to them about taking some control because mm-hmm. otherwise they're going to hit college in their freshman year and they're going to walk out your door and they're going to sit down in front of the PS4 they take with them in the dorm room yeah. and, they, you know, they're not going to move mm-hmm. for, for a year because they haven't sort of had any experience with trying to moderate them, that themselves. I, this, this is so hard. And it's hard in part because we didn't, our parents didn't have to do it. We didn't experience it. Um, you know, the screens are obviously different than TV, if for no other reason than you couldn't really watch TV 24 hours a day when a lot of us were little. And then you got into the point where you could, but it's not like you, it's not like it was good TV. <laughs> How many Leave It to Beaver reruns mm-hmm. can you possibly watch? Oh, it was horrible. So, so right. Yeah. So these are different. They are more compelling. But I think an important thing to remember is that our teenagers are part of our national conversation about how these devices are going to be a p- part of our lives. So they're thinking about it, too. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not... I don't know any 16-year-olds that are like, and what I really want to do with the next three hours is be on my Instagram. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't be, but they're aware that that's not like the best choice. Right. Yeah, they're like aware. filling their glass with yeah. something nourishing. Yeah, and they're talking to each other about it, and they're talking to their pediatricians, and they're talking with their teachers, and they're writing papers, and they're trying to solve this problem, which is going to be theirs as yeah. a generation in a big way. Yeah. They're working on it. They really are. So I think we should feel a little less panicked about sort of turning that over to uh-huh. them. I feel like I'm interested in your reaction to this. Like, I f- For me, I feel like two of the most important things that I want to instill in my kids are a strong sense of self, whether that manifests in independence or just self-assuredness, self-confidence, just an independent security in their own being. Uh, And also, to the extent that this is possible, I don't know if it is, to help guide them towards something that they feel passionate about, that that makes them feel alive, whatever that thing is. Because I feel like if they have a motor that is self-generating, that that feels like half the equation is solved right then and there. And that has to come from within themselves. But I feel like as a parent, part of my job is to, when they identify something that lights them up, mm-hmm. to kind of move in and support that or help kind of like f- fertilize that soil so that like little sprout can bloom. Right. Um, I think the most... I honestly think that the biggest thing that you can do for both of those is to have those things for yourself, for yourself Mm -hmm. um, and your partner as well, to set an example of being a person in the world who has something that they that they choose to do um, sort of above, uh, uh, you know, that really lights them up, like you said, and also someone who is not super concerned about how others view them. Or you know, um, you know how what what the neighbors think and, and that sort of thing. To to be to be that strong person yourself, and also to have those strong interests yourself. 
if we look back at that sort of, I mean, you're a person who has that, and so am I. So if you sort of look back at, well, what helped me to get there? The answer, I, I'm just guessing, but the answer is probably not that your parents were driving you mm. to these things that you felt passionately mm-hmm. about. The answer is that you had time to find it. Yeah. And when you found it, you pursued it. And probably some of that came from maybe seeing other people in your lives and maybe life, and maybe it wasn't your parents, seeing other people find things and pursue them. The thing about passion for our kids is we can't, we can't find it for them. And we can't sign them up for it. Um, and if we sign them up for too many things that might be their passion, how are they going to, you know, yeah. what if their passion is glass blowing? You know, you, did, you, you didn't sign them up for that. Right, I mean, right. how, will they, how will they find it if, if all of their hours are filled? Um, yeah, I it's feel a great, like it's a great point. Being, you know, being ourselves and being that person ourselves is is honestly the best thing that we can do along with supporting them in their interests, but also letting them sort of let go of interests as, you know, even if they've spent 10 years playing baseball, which at this point, you know, your 13 year old could easily have done. Uh-huh. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they need to keep playing baseball through yeah. high school. And um, it's not a failure if they decide no. they want to walk away. From no, it. it gives them room to find to find their thing, which is probably not baseball. It's been a, 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 a wild kind of journey that my family has been on. And, and yes, you're correct. Like, I'm very blessed. I get to do this thing that does light me up, that, that um, makes me very excited every day. I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunities that I have. But to get to this point, I had to go from a dark place of having a much more traditional career, mm-hmm. uh, walking away from that and having to endure... Uh, many years of difficulty and hardship to get to this place. So now it's all great. Um, but I had to, I put my family through a lot to like get to this place. And, I, and I've, I've had to work through like a lot of guilt that mm-hmm. I've had over that because I couldn't, you know, buy the things that Susie was buying, you know, right. or I couldn't take the kids on this vacation. I couldn't, you know, we had cars repossessed. Like there was a lot of humiliating things that happened. It was very, very difficult. Um, and I spent a lot of time like feeling really badly about that. And we have two boys that are now 22 and 23, and they were the ones who were kind of old enough to really mm-hmm. have an awareness of what was going on. Our girls were kind of too young. Um, and it's been interesting to have conversations with them about that now. Uh, and what's interesting is that they'll say, they say like, yeah, it was hard. Like there were parts of that that were, that really sucked, but, but they do have some gratitude for it because they got to see somebody, um, take control of their life to do something that they felt strongly about. And they got to see how hard that is. Like in a world of entitled young people who Mm -hmm. feel like they just deserve to be rich and famous, they saw how difficult it was to like make that transition and and to build something. Um, And they're like, that was incredibly valuable. Like they're artists, they're trying to be musicians and and they're like, they realize like, this is going to be difficult. You know, this is is not going to just get handed to me. Um, And it was such a, it was a, you know, it's beautiful to hear that. I still feel guilty because yeah, well, I wish I could have done these other things. Yeah. Um, but I do think that there's, there is value in that. I, and I guess what I'm trying to say is, is um, for somebody who's listening who feels like they can't do what moves them because there'll be negative financial ramifications, yeah. that perhaps there is a way through. And the lesson that you're teaching your kids is, you know, there is value in pursuing something that you care about. Like you don't have to settle for a job for the purposes of making sure that you can pay the Netflix bill. Right. Or if you choose to do that, if you choose to say, you know what, uh, you know, uh, uh, accounting is not my passion, but it is what I do so that I can, you know, do mm-hmm. what the, the thing that I love on the weekend and on the other, you know, in the other time to, to, to embrace that as an active choice that yeah. you're, cause that's an okay choice too, right? I mean, we can't, we can't all make the right choices, but what we're showing our kids is I make decisions that, um, you know, affect all of our, our lives. And then I look for the good, you know, I, I look for the things about this 
experience that I'm having that I'm enjoying, that I'm appreciating. Mm -hmm. And I I find those things and I share them with you. And, you know, we all go out um, and we we try to sort of enjoy. I I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm reaching for like a thing that that anybody can can do. But, um, you know, I go to work because I choose to get the paycheck so that after work, you know, we can choose to um, hike every right. weekend or whatever, you right. know, and maybe it, that's, everybody makes different choices. But the important thing to show our kids, I think, is that we're not just sort of letting life fall where where it may. We're not just accepting. And if we want to make a change, we make a change. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, I wanted to go back to something that you said, which was about how your road included some some darkness. And I think the thing that's really hard for us as parents, and this is hard for me, so this is not like me, the expert, saying I'm going to do this and it's going to, because I haven't done this yet. Our kids are probably going to go through some darkness. Yeah. It, it blows. You know, like, but on the other hand, really, really, do you want to raise the kid who's never so much as lost a balloon? Like, of do you course want, not, especially <laughs> in an environment where resilience right. is going to be important. Yeah. Do you want to send that kid out in the world? You know, do you want to like, send out the college roommate that doesn't even know that when you put the dishes in the sink that fairies don't come? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't actually, we're not doing anybody a service if we give our kids the happy unicorn rainbow childhood. Um, we're doing them a service if we give them the real childhood, you know, yeah. and, and, and the, the yeah, real yeah, experience yeah. of being part of our, our real families and our real lives. Yeah. All right. So I have a, a scenario okay. to present you with for your advice. So we're in a very interesting moment right now. Our family, our two older boys have moved out. So it's just my wife and our, our, our two girls who are 14 and 11. Our 11-year-old goes to school around the corner. Our 14-year-old just got into this performing arts high school called mm-hmm. LOXA that she spent a year preparing her portfolio for. She's a visual artist uh, and against tremendous odds was accepted. And she's just started ninth grade at this wow. school. This school is east of downtown. It Ooh. is a two hour drive from our house. Ooh. So we have been doing a lot of game theory around how to solve this equation and, 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 and maintain the cohesion of our family unit. Should we, you know, take turns driving? Should we, like, whatever. We, we spun all the scenarios, and we ultimately decided that the, the best way to maintain the health and integrity of our family and support our daughter is to rent an apartment downtown. Mm-hmm. And so we did that. I'm very blessed to be able to do that. Yep. Um, but my wife and I, and this is just starting, like we're only in our first right. month of this. My wife and I have now had to take turns or yep. we get to take turns spending time with her, uh, our older daughter downtown, while the other one is here tending to the other one. So now we're in this situation where we're ships in the night, both single parents to one child Oof. and taking turns going back and forth. Yeah. And the... The, the kind of scenario that's presented itself or the, the choice that we have is to say, this is unbelievably burdensome, how hard, how difficult, it's never going to work. Or to say, what an incredible, look what our daughter created. Uh, because of what she's manifested, we now get to have this adventure where we get to experience what it's like to be in downtown LA right. and, and have a different kind of lifestyle experience well, we support her in her pursuit of her dream in the way that, in many ways, our family and our kids really had to support Julie and I in the pursuit of our dream. Right. But what I want to do, what I want to make sure that I do is, is carve out that time for family and to make sure that, you know, because there's still, even with the back and forth, there's still all this driving. It's, it's mm-hmm. insane to make sure that we're still functional professionally and and with respect to like our marriage so that we can make all of this work and be happy and functional. Right. Wow. I mean that's that's so exciting for your daughter and it sounds like she really made it happen herself. 
Totally did. And Which, she's very she's very self sufficient. She's ready to move out and be emancipated. Like she'd be like, I'll just stay down here and eat postmates, you know, have postmates deliver my food and take Ubers. I'm like, All right, well you're fourteen. That's not happening. Uh, yet, but, yeah, you know. and you probably don't have the no. financial resources yeah, to no, bring no, that no. off yourself. Yeah, no. So um yeah, I that I think that you're right that that if you're gonna go all in with the daughter downtown that it needs to be like it, you know, this is an adventure. We're we're doing this thing, but realistically, like you and and your wife are making huge sacrifices so that she can she can go to this high school. Um, and your other daughter is making a sacrifice mm-hmm. too, which she presumably did not sign up yeah, for. Yeah, she didn't have a choice in the matter, really. No, uh, which is okay. Kids don't always, you know, you don't always get a choice, and yeah. and, and presumably she'll get her turn. Um, I, yeah, I would. I mean. One of the things I think as I sort of hear the story is that I would make sure that that daughter is also making some sacrifices. Like, you know, she may not be able to do all or maybe, you know, she needs to be getting her own, you know, finding rides or finding friends mm-hmm. that she can stay with or, you know, some of the time it, it can't fall. In, it can't fall. Yeah, that's way. a good point. I mean, yeah. yeah. And we're having that conversation a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll report that. <laughs> so far, so good. But well, it, you know, the difficult, the, the hardest part is, you know, I'll, I'll get an email or a phone call. Hey, can you do this thing? It's in like six weeks from now on this day. Right. And I'm like, well, I don't know I if don't I can know. do. Where am I going to be down? And where am I going to be? I'm not sure. You know, so having to figure all that out. But I think with some just communication, we can solve all of this. And right. it's, a cha- it's a challenge. I mean, we're up for it. It's cool. We'll see how it goes. Well, but and you're just, you know, it's, uh, embracing the drive yeah, time. Yeah. Embracing. I mean, that's, you know, what I, I talk a lot about, like, don't let your kids do things that are, well, I don't, I don't really. I mean, my kids all play travel hockey. That means that um, my husband or I, we spend, I mean, we spend hours in the car with one Driving or two. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, and one of the things that I have made a conscious decision around is, is exactly what you were talking about, about the adventure of the apartment is, you know, it's very easy to go into this stuff and be like, oh, this is the last place I want to be. This is awful. I can't believe I have to drive two hours in the snow to, you know, stand in a cold rink for 40 minutes while you play a high and then drive back. This is stupid. But The truth is that there's actually nowhere I would rather be, given that you are this child and that Mm. you want to do this thing and that I want to support you. And I don't, you know, I don't give you everything by, by any means, but this is something that we can do. So we're doing it and we're going to do it in, you know, in a joyful and open spirit spirit instead of making everyone like sort of suffer for, yeah, yeah, I mean, some days it's, uh, let's, who are, who are we kidding? Especially when it is snow, but, and I think I'm sure some days that that downtown piece is going to be like a huge slog for you guys. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, you're, she's going to know that you're so lucky that you can, that you can make it happen, but that's okay. It's okay. You know, like you've, you've built a world where you can do that for your kid and you can enjoy that you can do it. And how do we, you know, as kids become teenagers, you know, 14 year old daughter, 11 year old daughter is going to be a teen soon. And I'm concerned about maintaining open communication Right. Mm-hmm. Like making sure that they feel safe and, and, and want to talk about what's going on. Like we were, we did a great job with the boys with that. Girls is, it's, Girls a, different, is harder. it's a different thing. Different, you know, and you yeah. see as they age up and become pubescent and that their interior lives start to, they, they cloister themselves a little bit and not, they don't want to talk about everything that's going on. And there's that compulsion as a parent, if you're going to spend an hour in a car that you got to like make this conversation happen, right? Right. What's going on? And it's like nothing. How's everything? Fine. Uh, Okay. And then, okay, do I like press here? Do I just let it go? How do I, as a parent, try to, um, you know, create an environment that is most conducive to productive, healthy communication? Right. Well, what, what I... What I see, and you know, this is this is me. This is me, re, you know, reporting on what I've reported on. This uh-huh. is what I'm seeing around me. Is that um, kids who are communicative stay communicative as they get to be ten, and kids who are, you know, sort of more keep things more to themselves, unfortunately, sort of stay that way. That mm-hmm. that isn't something that you can, you know, that you can change, and that the best. 
things to do are to have a lot of conversations around a lot of like sort of to, you know, maybe you fill that drive time with, with podcasts that start communication, you know, that start conversations. Maybe you set a rule that they, I mean, this is not a rule in our family. It's just more so sort of, it, it happens that the only, that the child who rides in the front seat most is not a, fr- is not a phone child. Mm-hmm. You know, he has one, but he'll talk. And it has occurred to me that I need to actually make a rule as the others move up into the front seat, that if you're going to ride in the front seat with me, you can't do it. Well, I'm good, staring every, down everyone, at my, at my every, device. Yeah, it's like, then you have these competing interests. Like everyone right. wants to be in the front seat, but they also want to be on their phone. So right. what wins? So, you know, if you're up there, you, yeah. you have to do your part. You have to talk to the driver. You have to be entertaining company. I mean, within mm-hmm. reason, you know, can you answer your friend's text and tell them when you're going to be there? Absolutely. But, you know, can you control the radio and force me to listen to, to nothing but hits one only if I'm in the mood? But, uh-huh. um, so making, I guess, making sort of establishing expectations, especially as your kids are are getting into this, that they won't be sitting there with the phone, that they won't, you know, that, that they have, you know, and then just if the conversation's not about like personal stuff that's happening at school, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, And I don't know. And um, a a great, so this is, uh, there's this uh, wonderful writer about adolescent girls, Lisa Damore. You should Mm. look her up. She's got um, a book coming out and another one. Um, already out there, but she's taught me a lot. She used to write for me at the Times. And she, one of the things that she taught me is that a great way to get your kids to talk to you about what's happening in school is for them to tell you what other people are doing. Mm. It's not that they are, but, well, you know, so I don't know, are you afraid? I, I keep hearing that like everybody is, is, um, you know, is, is Snapchatting. Is that something you're seeing your friend? That's not a great example, but is that something you're seeing your friends doing? Not, are you doing it? Right. But you know, what are you seeing? Cause a lot of the time, um, you know, they'll, they'll sort of get down into it with gossiping about one of their friends yeah. or, or somebody that you both know. And you can, you know, you can just learn things about what's well, it going cracks on. The, it, it cracks that door open. Yeah. And then before they know it, they're talking about other stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's, I've noticed that, like, if you just start talking about, well, in general, just talking about things they're interested in, that yeah. you're not even asking them questions, then there's there's a relaxation that I think takes right. place. And, and we are sure. a big, um, we listen to a lot of, of news and podcasts in the car, more mm-hmm. so than music, but are always, sort of, lots of times, you know, turning it off to talk about it or talking about it yeah. while it's still going on. I have had some really surprising, I had one of my kids get completely obsessed with Bernie Madoff. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, it was a, I think it was a Freakonomics episode where they uh-huh. played part of a podcast that was like the story. And he was like, what? What? Tell, and we had to go and get the whole podcast and download it. And uh-huh. for like multiple rides, we, we did nothing but, but made off. And how can that happen? And he wanted, to, like, he, he wanted to find within himself, would I be the person who would have spotted this that nobody right. else spotted it? Mm-hmm. Like, would I, you know, he, it was like he could see all these people going along. You know, that's actually been a theme of conversations that I've been having with my kids for a long time. All these people that go along with things that are wrong, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's sort of the, the record screech, and everyone realizes that it's wrong, but tons of people get caught up. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We talk about that a lot. I'm not quite sure why. That's, wow. You know, How old is he? That kid is only, is 12. Yeah. Uh, but even with the other ones, you that's know, we, we're, we're often talking about, like, um, you know, here he, all the all the... All the guys at that military academy that were that had the secret Facebook page where they were talking about whether the women mm-hmm. were hot. Mm-hmm. Um, like, would you be the one to say something? Mm-hmm. And I don't. That's right. Yeah, it's like a thought experiment. Right. You know. So these hypotheticals no right are answers, great, but you can it provokes a discussion. Yeah. yeah, and it doesn't have to be like a personal discussion. I I don't know. You know, you might get the kid who's going to say, you know, my boyfriend and I are considered, but honestly, you probably won't. Mm-hmm. I mean, I right. I don't think I have that kid. I don't have any idea. But yeah. um, well, let's turn the focus back on on the health of the parents. Yes, we really <laughs> got off into yeah. kids, didn't That's we? That's all right. It yeah. was it was super helpful. Thank you. <laughs> so you have these. Like mantras, right? That you that you talk about in the yes. book about. Um, ways you can to be think happy when this. your children aren't. Do you know? Decide what to do, then do it. Um, soak up the good. Uh, yeah, I have the. Don't go in there. You don't have to go in there. Those are really things that like are sort of constantly playing in the back right. of my head. I, like I seem to need put to put on the refrigerator the to remind yourself. In fact, I have a magnet. Oh, you do? <laughs> I do. Really? <laughs> yeah. For each one of the mantras, or uh, it's like... got five. Ma- it's got five mantras oh, really? on it. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. 
Um, what's the one that you think trips up parents the most? Like, what's the number one thing where you see parents kind of going awry? Well, and this is me, too. Uh-huh. Um, uh, what you want now is not always what you want later. This goes to the core of what we were just talking about, because what you want now is for your kid to be happy. What you want later is for your kid to have, like, you know, learned resilience Mm -hmm. and learned to bounce back from setbacks. But you got goodness knows you don't want to, like, be supplying setbacks. That's not what any of us want. And then it goes down into sort of the very nitty gritty of letter layer, you know, level of parenting. What you want now is to pick up the towel off the bathroom floor. What you want later is to have a kid who picks up the towel off the bathroom floor. And that may, that will take 12 years of daily repetition, Uh but it's much, you know, it's much easier to just pick up the towel because what you want now is no towel on the floor. Right. But you know, what you the thing to do is to go get the kid and drag right. him back into it's the bathroom. It's just easier to pick up the towel it's than to like go to pick, pick up, up the, the towel, towel, pick up the towel, pick up the towel, put your shoes on, put your shoes on, where are your shoes, where'd mm-hmm. you leave your shoes, where's mm-hmm. your shoes, where's your shoes, put your <laughs> shoes away, Yeah, you know? Oh yeah, no, we're, we're all... We're all doing that. Yeah. So, and you know, you're not going to get, the, well, this is another mantra. You're not going to get that right every time. Mm-hmm. We don't have to get it right every time. But if more often than not, you're trying to err on the side of what you want later, it's better for everybody. Mm-hmm. Happier parents, happier kids. What do we do about the parents that are overly invested in their children's successes and failures? And what I mean by that is, you know, the parent, everything from the parent who's on the sidelines at the soccer game, like losing his or her shit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like we all know that person. Oh, yeah. To the parent who is super invested in their children's grades because they want to make sure that their kid goes into the right college so they can tell their friend at the cocktail party. Well, we wish them luck. I feel like this is, this is an <laughs> epidemic of parents yeah. living vicariously through their children's experiences, which I think is just creating nothing but suffering and harming yeah. children. We wish them luck. We try to find someone else to talk to at the cocktail party. Uh, you know, if we talk to the, a parent and they're not already doing that, we talk about how we don't want to be that parent. So that, you know, I guess we're assuming that those are not us. But I think what the real question is probably what do we do so that we're not accidentally, you know, how do we know if that's yeah, I mean, us? Right. Like, psycholo- <laughs> like there's obviously it's a spectrum, right? Yep. So I feel like psychologically, the more dissatisfied we are in our own lives mm-hmm. or the more we feel like we've made compromises, the more prone we are to that predicament of being overly invested in our children. Yeah. Well, and plus it can be fun, especially like kids sports. Um, that can, that can be, that can be like a real family experience. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go and then maybe you end up on the board of, of whatever the sport is. And you're part of like, you know, making it great for the kids and you're part of hiring the coaches and, and, you know, you're like really into this. And all of a sudden your kid's like, you know, I don't want to play baseball this year. And you're just like, (laughs) <laughs> but, but I, all my friends, yeah. Are, yeah, right. um, you know, so, so we have to sort of, uh, watch that. Well, I mean, there's involvement and yeah. then there's over involved, right? Yeah. Like, and then there's, there's, there's over involvement. So, um, kids will say there's some really great research out there done by some, some coaches. Kids will say that their least favorite part of a sports event is the ride home when dad or mom has, has tips, right. ideas. Thoughts. Maybe you should advice. think about doing it this yes, way. Yes, constructive criticism. Um, and, you know, there, there actually is a right thing to say after a game, and it is, I love to watch you play. Would you like some ice cream? Mm. Well, or, you know, whatever. It doesn't mm. have to be ice cream. But, and, and it's really, it's nothing more than that. If your kid wants to analyze, it's, it's listening, it's supporting, it's not, you know, you know, you, I think that the thing to look at is nobody wants to be that parent in the eyes of other parents, but you really don't want to be that parent in the eyes of your kid. You don't want your kid to be the one saying, I really hate the ride home. Could you give me, you know, can I get a ride home with someone else? Um, you know, or, or the one who is like, I don't know if I want to play this next year because I don't, you know, because I'm, I'm afraid of disappointing my parent or because okay. I'm tired of you know, sort of going through that. So if we 
shift the lens onto how it's affecting our relationship with our kids, that can maybe help us to step out of it. Um, but to me, probably the biggest thing, I mean, the, the greatest way to keep yourself from obsessing about like packing from your, for your kids swim tournament is to be packing for your own swim tournament. Mm -hmm. um, I talked mm -hmm. to this one parent and she had, uh, she had high school age triplets that were all on the swim team. And as she was taking them to all the swim practices and stuff like that, when they were in about middle school, she had swum as a high schooler. Yeah. Uh, it turned out their coach was starting a master's league. And, you know, the next, so instead of sort of going down the road of, I'm going to run all your tournaments and I'm going to do the scoring stuff, she signed up for the Master's League. Uh -huh. And, you know, the next thing you knew, they, sure, they had a, they had a meet. She had a meet. She had a meet. Yes, yeah, so they're all practicing at the same time. Well, and, and they have to get a ride. You know, they have to, they have to find their own way because she had her own thing. And that's, I mean, that's really great for kids to sort of have to, you know, you, you want to swim, you want to do your thing, make, you know, make it happen, make some stuff happen for yourself. I'm not going to facilitate all of it. I'll facilitate some of it, mm -hmm. but because I've got my own, you know, I've got my own stuff going on over there. So I think the biggest anecdote and antidote, not anecdote is having your own stuff. Yeah. That's a hard leap for a lot of people though. I mean, it goes back to how we opened this yeah. with somebody who's like, look, I'm just trying to keep it together. Like my own thing. Like I don't have time, you know, I barely have time to, you know, wake up in the morning and trying to get the kids out of the house. You know, I'm exhausted before I've even started my day. Well, let yeah. them get themselves out of the house. Yeah. How does that work? Oh, that works great. That's actually one of my favorite <laughs> yeah. things. So I have two pieces of advice about mornings. And the first is get more sleep, which makes everybody crazy. And people just want to throw me off of things because that's boring. It's been said, but it's so true. But we'll put that aside and just go to like this question of, oh, my God, you have to get your kids to school and they have to have their backpack and their homework and their sneakers and their violin and their lunch and six manila folders and a jar of grape jelly. And you have no idea why. But, you know... And it's 7.52. Um, so the big thing for parents is it's a big deal to your kid, whether they get to school at 7.59 or 8.01. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal to you. You're, you're okay. I mean, maybe you need to clock in, but most of us have a little breathing leeway there. So we don't need to, like, we don't need to go in there. We don't need to go into that chaos because if your kid gets to school and they don't have their homework and they don't have their sneakers and they don't have their violin and they don't have their lunch and they don't have six manila folders and a jar of grape jelly, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And so will they. In fact, it's good for them because then Next they have... Exactly. But this is not like, I'm going to make you fail so you will learn. This is just more like, hey, it's morning. I'm getting myself ready. I'm helping you get ready. But I don't need to be losing. I don't need to be losing my mind. Like, we don't need to do this thing. And believe me, I used to do this thing where, like, you screech out of the, you just screech into the drop-off line, and you know, the last possible minute, and your kid opens the door, and you scream out the window after him. I told you you'd be late, and the door slams, and you drive off in a cloud of smoke. You just don't have to go to that place as the parent. You can be more. You know, you can say. Hey, I'm sorry you can't find your lunch. Let me let me give you a hand. Or I'm sorry you can't, you can't find your lunch, but I'm braiding your sister's hair now. I can't, you know, I can't I can't do that for you. Um, mm -hmm. Man, it really sucks that you didn't finish that homework last night. That's going to be tough. We got to get out of the house. You want a pop tart for the car ride? I mean, you can you can you don't have to be you don't have to be in the crazy with them. Instead, you can be like sort of a a calm or if you're crazy getting yourself out the door then be crazy getting yourself out the door but yeah so their what you're thing saying is their thing yeah it's 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 not changing it's not the changing reality, no. reality of what's going on it's changing mm -mm. your relationship to it your reaction to it yeah because you don't have to suffer you know like you don't have to suffer that with them it's not mm -hmm. i mean it's actually really great like you don't even have to inflict the consequences for them being late or not right. having their stuff somebody else is going to do that this is one of those areas of parenting where you can sit back and let the world take care of you know this this is going to be a problem your child will have their whole life they will always have to be you know i don't know it's been a, the story of my life anyway you always have to be somewhere earlier than anybody wants to be anywhere um that's just for whatever reason, right. that's the way we have arranged modern society. So they might as well deal with it now. What about homework? Homework. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know where that sweet spot is that exists between being overly involved and, and allowing space for that exploration, whether it's failure or success. Like, 
did you do your homework? What do you have for homework? Do you have all your books? Do you have everything you need <laughs> to perform your homework? Where are we at with the homework? You can't do that until you've done your homework. Can I see where you're at with your homework? What happened last day? Did you turn that thing in? Like, I don't want to be that person, but I found myself being that person mm-hmm. at times. And I, I, I can tell you it doesn't work so great. No, it's <laughs> yeah. not that great. You know, It's not that great for anybody. And yet you have to do some of it. So every principal and educator that I talked to wanted parents to know one thing about homework. And that was that when we make it our job to make sure that it gets done, to make sure that it gets back in the backpack, to make sure that it's done correctly, you know, to, to, to make sure that it's done right. When we turn that into our job, we've defeated the whole purpose of homework. Right. Like that's not what the teacher wants. That's not helpful. Um, some teachers, and I, I talked to one teacher who was like, I just, you know, I don't even, the school requires me to give homework. This is frustrating. And we can like, whether or not there should be homework is a whole different conversation. But the teacher was like, yeah, the school requires me to do it, but I don't even pay any attention to it. Cause I know the parents are doing it. Oh, ouch. You know, <laughs> like that's the worst possible thing. So, so, so there's, there's that piece of it. But on the other hand, you got to know what's going on because if your kid has a massive assignment due on Wednesday, and, you know, it's Friday. But what you know is that Tuesday has got, you know, Tuesday's a busy, is a, is a big day for your family because it's got soccer. But then you happen mm-hmm. to have a meeting. So after soccer, they have to go home with somebody else and have dinner. And you've arranged all this stuff. But maybe they're either only vaguely aware of that or not aware of it at all, depending on how they old they are. And then they have this thing due on Wednesday. So to mm-hmm. some extent, like homework affects all, you know, it affects the family plans. It affects. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, if I don't intervene on some level, that homework won't get looked at until Tuesday at 10 PM. Well, that, and then it'll be yeah. 10 PM to 1 AM. Yeah. And, and so I feel like I have to say, look, you want to go, you want to be with your friends all weekend. You, you can do that if you do your, if you get all of your stuff done beforehand. Right. But I'm so, not letting you leave it to the last minute. Yeah, that's more like, that's, I, to me, that's in the area of like guidance around you have a lot of stuff to do um, and you want to do these things over the weekend. So how are you going to set your, depends on how old the kid is. If the kid is eight, it's probably you have to get this done before you can do this stuff over the weekend. If the kid is 12, it's more like, If you don't get those things done and you do this stuff on the weekend, Monday night's going to be ugly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're not, are they going to get their healthy nine and a half hours of sleep? No, but you want them to have that experience at 12, not at 19. Yeah. So, you know, letting some of that happen is okay. The thing, sort of the thing to avoid is the thing where it ends up being your fault because you didn't tell them that there was all this stuff going on on Tuesday and they right. didn't. So, so there's this and it's complicated. Yeah. Well, but then that's <laughs> the other thing about homework though. If you are the homework police, if you are the one who's always saying, do you have it? How much do you have? How long is it going to take you? Is it done? Let me look at it. Let me make sure that it's done right. Suddenly the homework is your fault mm-hmm. and I hate you. Because you are making me do my homework. And that isn't like, it's not, a, it's not a great role to be in with your kids. So the goal is to, to have the homework be what the school gives the kid that they're expected to be able to do on their own, but to provide them from the, you know, the guidance to turn into somebody that can get those things done yeah. for themselves. And how you do that kind of varies. You know, some kids can do it really, I, you know, I, I have... I've got, I've got four. Um, one of them, I don't need to, two of them, actually, I don't ever, I don't, I don't ever need to say the word homework. That's there. They, they got this. Mm -hmm. The third one is somewhere in between. And the fourth one, he spent a lot of time with his homework. He didn't spend a lot of time doing his homework. (laughs) He would just exist in the space with his homework. And it would sort of make us all really, really insane. That one needed a lot more guidance with how much, you know, when, and, and sort of still does to some right. extent. So that it, it kind of varies from kid to kid. But the goal, ideally before high school, is somebody who can figure out their own schedule because high school is when things start. Yeah, and in order for that to happen, you have to let go. You do. Right? We just keep coming back to that, don't I we? And, I you know, for the 400th time, it's not like I'm doing all this perfectly. Yeah. It's just that I know what we're supposed to do. And sometimes that's really miserable. Sometimes I stand in my kitchen washing dishes going, I know I was supposed to make the kids do this. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is not, I'm not doing it right. 
but I just want to go to bed. Exactly. I don't care what I want later. I want what I want now. How, uh, let's talk about like family time and meal time. Mm -hmm. How do you think about these things? How do you, how do you approach these opportunities in a healthy way? Well, I think it is so important to find a good space, like a, a good rhythm for your 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 dinner time and perspective in, in particular. And this isn't like dinner time prevents drug use or, mm-hmm. or whatever. It's more that there's some really great in-depth research out there where they, they watch the patterns of families living in a house all together. And the time that you and your partner, if you have one, and your kids all spend in the same room at the same time, especially once kids start going to full-time school, is really consolidated around the dinner hour. Um, so that's like, that's your time. Mm-hmm. So whether you, whatever you do to make that look like a good positive time, that's the important part. I mean, is it, hel- is it important that your family eat a healthy, balanced, wonderful meal where they're all, you know, singing grace beforehand? Um, I, I guess that's up to you. But really the key is just, that's your time. Like that's, that's the block. That's the space people tend to be all together. So find a way to make it, to make it good. And if your way of making it good involves everybody eating cereal, that's okay. Because, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's the finding the good thing that matters to me. I mean, or that, that, that should matter to you. That, that's important. This is the time your kids are going to look back on. And it's not any one meal. It's all of the meals. It's all of the things. It's, you know, we always did it this way. And so-and-so always sat here. And, you know, we always argued about this. And that's your sort of, that's your ritual time. It really is. Yeah. Now that's going to, for us, that's only going to be maybe one day a week. Yeah. You know, which I'm lamenting. But the flip side of this for me is that, and this really is about like. Well, and remember, when, you've had a lot of it. Yeah, no, we have, we have, <laughs> we have. But with my eleven-year-old, like I just, you know, when when you've had older kids that have left the house, you become much more acutely aware mm-hmm. of just how short and fresh, you know, sh- this time period is, mm-hmm. and how you really need to take advantage of it because it does pass so quickly. And one of the things that I became aware of uh, is that when. Like our, when our boys were living with us, and we also had our nephew living with, we had a lot of people in this house, and it's great. There's a cacophony and like just a community, you know, a community kind of spirit about it that was yep. really beautiful and wonderful. Um, but I found that my individual relationship with one particular kid was not as strong as it could be because there was very few opportunities for total one-on-one, right? And I would have to be very intentional about carving out time. Like, hey, you and me, we're just going to go do this. Mm-hmm. When you have four, it's hard to like make sure oh, you're yeah. balancing all of that. Yep. And I didn't always do a very good job of that. But I would always know, like, when I did do that, you know, like, hey, we're just going to go spend the afternoon. It doesn't even have. It doesn't have to be some big thing. Right. Go to a no. Movie, in fact, it's probably better if it's not. Come to the grocery store with yeah. me. You know, you can pick and out some stuff a, for your lunch, yeah, and I'll like do a the bond, shop. You know? Yeah. So, despite the fact that we're not going to have this total family unit meal time, I actually am excited about having that one-on-one time, like whether it's with my older daughter downtown or my younger daughter here, like I rarely get to be with them alone. Right. And so there is something cool about that, that I want to make sure that I'm paying attention to. Yeah. And how do I do that in a way that's, that can best foster like our relationship and our communication? Well, just the doing it is, I mean, that, that's, it's the, it's the, it's the accumulation. I mean, I think we get, we put a lot of value on, you know, the, the quality time or the one hour or the one interaction, but just, you know, knowing that you've got, um, you know, a whole, who knows what'll happen after this year, but you've got a whole year of, you know, this is the time when I'm going to be with this child. And this is the time when I'm going to be with this child. And and that's going to turn into that year when we, ordered Chinese for every single, every Wednesday, Uh or, you know, that one year when, um, uh, you know, we had to eat dinner at five because I had something at say, or we had in our family, it's that year when we ate at the skinny pancake every Tuesday and Thursday, because our hockey practices were like at five, six and seven. So, 
Somebody, some right. chunk of the family would sit in this crep restaurant <laughs> while other kids sort of got cycled through. Yeah. You know, it was a crazy, ridiculous year. I mean, those are the we, memories I have yeah. when I think back on my childhood. Like, I remember my mom went to night school and my dad would take us to the Hot Shops diner. And, like, I still remember that. Like, yeah. I remember that more vividly than. Yeah. My mom most went to college and my happened. dad would take me to throw food to the ducks. Um, right. you know, at the, at the, in the pond at Texas Women's University. I'm sure that, that well, they probably weren't because it was that time and they were, you know, trying to make something of themselves mm-hmm. and that's what they were focused on. But if they thought about it, it was probably, you know, feeding the ducks is not the best use of this child's time. Right. I mean, I think <laughs> I have this instinct like, oh, if I have, I've got an afternoon and I can just be with this child it needs to be this epic adventure. We're going to ride roller coasters yeah, and we're going to right. do we're going to do it and it's got to be amazing so that she'll remember it forever. And in truth, like I always have to remind myself like it's it has nothing to do with any of that. Like Mm-mm. we could just go, you know, do something let's go walk the dog, you know, yeah. let's go to, go to the We can't store, control what so. they're going to remember about what we're doing either. It's just that you know, we 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 do get to do a lot of it. And that's Yeah. And that's that's really important. Like we have we have a lot of time here. Um, then, like you said, suddenly it's gone. Mm-hmm. But you do get to sort of accumulate this this big. That's I would imagine that's why that family it, relationships are so yeah big. That intensity probably is much more acute if you're a single parent and your time. Like you only have a certain amount of time with your like if you're sharing custody, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Some of the single parents that I've talked to sort of see that you, you know you can look at it as a boon because then you can have your own you know you can have your own and then you can have your kid space and you can sort of create these you have more opportunity to like be you know take care of yourself exactly right? and yeah. and then when you're with them so, so you it's possible to see it as a boon not everybody does and I don't think you have to but um you know some people some people sort of are like well. It's a silver lining. I mean, you know, yeah. this is not necessarily what I planned, but uh-huh. we're we're looking at it as, you know, opportunity for my partner to spend, you know, really solid time and for me to spend really solid time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like so much of, of the perspective, the place that you're coming from, isn't necessarily about doing things differently it's more in the how the, how how you're doing them like your emotional disposition well yeah you're, it's how you think about it carrying these things some out. things we can actually do differently i mean i you know i can still come back to not packing in our time and trying to to value sleep or you know there there you can you can look at so you can find like the thing this is so i just talked to someone and this was so cool she like realized that one thing that was making her unhappy, this is a parent, in her week was that every Friday, for whatever reason, when she picked her kid up from school, the kid, the, the transition was too much. And I, I, I've had this. The like, transition from school to home can be huge. And the kid would just lose it in the car, just, you know, yell at her or just this really unpleasant ride. So and this was a pretty little kid. He was only uh-huh. six. So she said to him one day, I noticed that every Friday when I pick you up, you're angry, like you have a tantrum. Um, and that's actually not working for my schedule. Friday afternoon's not a good time. So I was thinking, could we schedule the tantrum for Friday evening? Uh-huh. Because I think that would be better for both of us. And the kid, you know, laughed. And then they made this sort of big joke. And when he got in the car on Fridays, she would say, um, so remember, we're scheduling the tantrum for later. And then like later, he would have a big fake tantrum. So that I thought that was this great example of like looking at a thing that was making her and her kid unhappy and finding a thing to do differently. Mm -hmm. So we can do that like Mm -hmm. around small things, but you're right that a lot of being a happier parent is about your mindset. It's about choosing how to look at the experiences that you're having and choosing how, you know, how to interact with your kids and sort of deciding a big, a big part of being happier is what you pay attention to. Mm-hmm. It's well, you know, it's deciding to pay attention to the things that that are happy. Mm-hmm. How do you think about respecting your kids' privacy and when it's appropriate to, you know, impede on that? Like, if you feel like something isn't going right, like, do you look at their phone? Do you never look? At, like, how does that? How does all of that? Work? Like, I've never had to really, you know, I've never gone into my kids' phones, right? I mean, we have good, healthy communication around that, but I'm also not 
not naive, right. you know, about yep. what's going on online. And so I'm always wondering, you know, where that like kind of line. Yeah, exists. I'm. I am. I'm not an expert in that. I too have not had that experience. I've talked. You know, I, I've interviewed and I've researched and I've looked into it. And the biggest thing um, that I've that I've found and the advice that I've found is that if you're going to spy on your kids, they should know that you're doing like so, you know, if you're tracking their phone or their movements or, mm-hmm. or whatever, they should know that you're doing it and they should know why. Um, that there should be an open communication about, you know, you're, I know that you are with these people and I know that they are smoking pot and therefore, you know, I'm going to be smelling your clothes when you get home or, you know, therefore I'm going to be, and I told you that I want to be, you to be in this place. And I know that sometimes you've gone somewhere else. So I'm going to be watching where your phone is. And if you turn it off, there's going to be consequences. Um, but I too haven't had that experience yet. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know that there's, you know, sort of one size fits all advice about that. Yeah, it's tricky. It's it's gets even more complicated when, you know, all these kids have their uh, they have their other private hidden accounts on mm-hmm. all these social media platforms. You know, they have their one account that their parents know about that's whitewashed because they know their parents are looking at it. Right. But then there's the other account, right? And Well, and that's the argument for like, not looking at it. Right. Is sort of more like, you know, and that, I mean, if if you can be in that place, and that's, I mean, it's a luxury. It's the it's the luxury of the parent who doesn't have reason to suspect that their kid is putting themselves in danger with mm-hmm. behavior. Um, but if you can be in the place of, you know, I'm not paying attention to your social media accounts. I'm not watching your every move because I've you've always been. You haven't shown me that I need to. Mm-hmm. Um, and as long as you don't show me that I need to. I'm not going to be that parent. And this is like, you know, this is kind of the conversation to have about, I mean, we were talked about having the conversation about what other kids do. It's also fun to have the conversation about what other parents do. Mm. Those other, those bad other parents (laughs) of your friends that are the parents that would spy on them. You know, I just want you to know that I don't do those things because you've never given me reason to think that I had to. And I think that's great. And, you know, what you're kind of also saying there is, and if you give me a reason, um, you know, maybe that would change. But, you know, if we're in that position where we don't have to, then I guess the hope is that the kid can have just the one social media account and be reasonably responsible yeah. with it. I think, yeah. you know, we hear a lot of horror stories, but you got to remember you only hear the horror stories. Yeah. You know, it's not like, you know, the, the, the 500,000 the... kids who are just Snapchatting themselves, pictures of themselves making pouty duck faces, don't make the news. It's the one who's, you know, Snapchatting their private parts that does. Yeah. I, I think even more kind of pervasive than that is just this idea that I don't know that we fully appreciate that, I mean, when you're, you know, a young adolescent, there's nothing more important than how you fit into your social Mm -hmm. network. Like the stakes are so high emotionally. And if you're not quite fitting in the fact that you can go on these social media platforms and watch in real time, the people in your social network enjoying their lives without you, or perhaps even at your expense is so psychologically damaging and it hasn't been around long enough yet such that I think we can properly gauge the impact of that. Right. But the extent to which, you know, a marginalized person can have that marginalization exacerbated by these tools that seem innocuous and are kind of intended to bring us closer together that are that are really, you know, wreaking emotional havoc on well, young people. There is a flip side, which is that that marginalized kid can connect with other marginalized kids. That's true. Kids. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, if you're the one, uh, you know, the one um, LGBTQ kid in your very tiny, you know, 60 person high school in northern rural New Hampshire, you can find a whole network of other, uh, you know, you can reach out, you can find those people. If you're the only kid who is super, super, super interested in coins and all your friends think that that's completely nerdy, you can find a world of people that are interested in coins. So there is a flip side 
that is, you know, the, the same kid who feels marginalized and alone where they are now can see that there's another place to mm. be and, and can work to get there. Yeah. Um, that's... It's true. It's, it is true. I, I, I think what happens is, well, this is just a larger observation of just parenting and having kids. Like, we live in a fear-based environment. That fear is, is you know, instilled in us from every source of media that we, that we absorb throughout our day. And it spills into, you know, how we parent because we're terrified mm-hmm. we're either going to be a bad parent or we're going to put our kid in danger or that our child's pain is our own pain or a reflection of our failures. And all of this is like this waterfall spilling onto our kids. Meanwhile, we're not taking care of ourselves because that feels indulgent. Right. And like we're not being a bad parent and we're falling behind and all of these sorts of things. So what's great about the book is it's like it's saying, stop, you do have to take care of yourself. That's the best way forward. But it can be so hard to break that that cycle of fear when it's so constantly reinforced. Well, there's a lot, especially around the, the screens and the social media, there's a lot to be afraid of just because it's not part of our own experience. And I think it's kind of interesting to look at the history here. So um, we are the maybe the second generation of parents for whom we can look at our kids' experience and go, well, that looks a lot like mine. Like, you know, I went to elementary school and then I went to middle school or junior high and then I went to high school and then I went to college. And that that and, you know, I some and what you're doing, sort of what you're marching through looks like what I did. Our parents, um, you know, like our our mothers, a lot of them weren't necessarily, you know, sure, they maybe they went to elementary school, junior school, uh, high high school, Mm -hmm. maybe college, but they weren't expected to excel in math and sciences. And maybe they weren't expected to have a job when they got like their their experience of adolescence and childhood had a different flair to it. Their parents, unless you are from a historically wealthy family, probably didn't even maybe they didn't go to high school. They probably didn't go to college um, historically. And then you so and then you sort of get immigrant parents who were looking at kids having... The point is, we're the first generation to look at our kids and expect them to have the same experience that we did, but they're not going to. It's it's not as much the same as we yeah. think that it is. So we sort of have this weird fear around, I need to make this the same. I need to make your experience look like mine. I need to, to control it. And I think our, our previous generations didn't they like didn't even have that expectation they were sort of looking and going well you're going to high school and i didn't go to high school so that's different you're just going to have to learn to figure that out yourself yeah. it was like a different um just a just a, a different space so we're coming at it and we're looking at that and we're not you know we, we don't like all those areas where it's where it's different those are the those are the scary bits i think that's a great point and i also think that we're judging we're judging the kids through the prism of our own experience. We're laying on top of that, that expectation of sameness. And at the same time, we're also measuring them against a yardstick that I'm not sure is really going to be all that relevant right. in terms of what, they're, what they really are going to need to be happy and successful in this rapidly advancing world. Right. I mean, if you can somehow... Just step back from your own, like, if you, if you can go back into your, your history and think about, like, you know, you're, in my case, I, I, I have this uncle, and he, you know, he, he went to college, but he couldn't quite, you know, just, and then he went and found himself, and then he did some, and eventually he went to vet school and became a very, but it took, you know, there was this winding road, um, and you probably have high school friends that had, you know, the winding road. They drove yeah. a van in Vail for four years before they, um, you know, before they founded a country, a company, or they drove a van in Vail for four years before they decided they really loved driving a van in Vail for four years. And they got married and they raised their kids while driving a van in Vail for four years. And that's what they did. And it worked out. Um, you know, we, we sort of able to accept that variation on working out for other people, but for right. our kids, it's really scary. We would like them we, you know, we think we would like them to go, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, graduate school, consulting firm. There, you know, I, and yeah. I don't, I don't know the it makes us feel safe and, and, yeah. and comfortable. Yeah. And we love to go. Oh my God! Did you hear so and so is driving a van? Can you believe that? <laughs> what is he doing? And then he finds the company, and the company does the IPO, and you're like, isn't right. that amazing? You know, it's yeah. it's all filtered through this weird 
judgment machine that we all have built into our yeah. DNA, I guess. Yeah, and I think we, you know, we easily lose sight. You know, we've talked a lot about Susie, the neighbor down the street who's doing all the things right and um, you know, has the best Instagram pictures and stuff like that. I think we forget that we are all doing something super cool. Like we're all doing something, we've all got our thing. So maybe your thing is that, you know, every weekend your whole family gets up and, and goes to church all together. Um, not, not a lot of families do, you know, a lot of families don't do that. Maybe your thing is that you're hiking all the 4,000 footers with your, your kids. That's a thing up in, in New England where we are. Um, maybe your thing is, you know, maybe you're a family of traveling cir- circus artists and therefore your kids are being raised as traveling circus artists. But if you're not a family of traveling circus artists, you're, you can't recreate that. So it's really important to be like, what? You know, when other people... When other people look at your Instagram, when other people look at your life, they're saying, oh, I wish I baked cookies every week with my kid. Mm. Or, you know, oh, I, I wish that, um, you know, my kid and I were taking pictures outside of every donut shop in the, you know, across New England while they went to hockey. Oh, I wish that my kid and I had dedicated a summer to finding the best burger in New Jersey. Um, you know, you're doing your thing, but the thing is your thing doesn't look cool because it's just your thing. That's a boring thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but everybody else, you know, like we all have a thing. We just, you have to, you have to find a way to sort of value what it is that you're doing with your kids and not worry quite so much about what other people are doing with theirs. Yeah. It's so true and so hard to do. It is hard to do. In all the uh, research that you did for this book, what was, what, what was something that most surprised you? Oh, what, what did you not expect? To this discover? is actually, there's, there's a really clear answer to that. So one of the pieces of research that I did myself was to work with a professor at Fordham University, and we created um, a, an academically peer-reviewed appropriate, uh, I would call it a survey, but I think there's a better word for it, um, study in which we got a thousand people who were, you know, demographically reflective of the United States, not a thousand of my closest Facebook friends, to respond to questions around um, happiness and parenting. And we used the academic measure for par- for happiness, which is uh, satisfaction. It's like uh, how 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 it's called efficacy, and it's how how good do you think you are at this uh-huh. thing? And so people is that best. Gretchen Rubin approved? I, it probably is Gretchen yeah. Rubin <laughs> okay. approved, but. Um, Yeah, Gretchen does her own stuff, and oh my gosh, it's amazing. Anyway, so we did this thing, and one of the things we had on there, as well as lots of, you know, questions about, well, how do you decide what your kids have to eat, and how do you feel about how much homework they have, and how do you feel about your involvement? We had this open-ended question. We actually had two, and one was, what do you like most? And the other one was, what do you like least? And you could just write. So many people responded with some variation of the word discipline that I went back and read through our survey to make sure we weren't secretly cueing them. Like, did we use the word discipline 46 times or something? Mm. There was nothing, you know, I couldn't find anything. Like a third, about a third of the answers accumulated around this idea of, I hate disciplining my kids. I hate making my kids follow the rules. I hate it when my kids do something wrong and I have to punish them. I hate having to come up with consequences. Like there was this real consensus that that was the thing. And I really think that if you had surveyed our parents, they would not have said that. I don't know Mm. what they would have said, but I don't think it would have been that. So that was really interesting. It didn't bother them to discipline. No. Right. So what do you make of that? I mean, what does that mean? Well, my, my theory, um, is that one of the things that's hard is that we are expected to have disciplined kids who behave in public spaces and, you know, act like disciplined kids, but there's no consensus anymore on how we're supposed to get there. Like when, um, when our parents were parenting and when we were being raised, there was this more authoritative culture. Um, authoritarian yeah. culture, where the idea was, if Wait your child your does, some, yeah, if your child does something wrong, there is a consequence, and that will teach your child not to do the wrong thing. And whether actually that didn't necessarily work, and it's got its problems, but it was a thing. Like there was an expectation. So when your child didn't do the right thing, you knew what you were going to do. Um, you know, you were going to ground them, or you were going to take away the television, or you were going to, you know, not let them go to the dance. You you knew. But now we don't really have an agreement around that. Now it's sort of, well, you know, do you have a conversation with them? Is this a learning experience? Do you try to, um, you know, do you try to talk to them? What works for your kid? And that's actually, I mean, it's, it's a better 
space. But uh, it's confusing. But There's it's no confusing. social consensus. It's upsetting. And if you, if you, well, um, I have a kid who's, who's tough and who has emotional challenges. And one of the things that we discovered for her with this, the consequences just completely backfired. So we would be in a public space and this child would do something, you know, horrific that would cause everyone else to sort of turn and stare at waiting for you to impose some form of, of, you know, terrible consequence and, and you know, and, and would observe us sort of just standing there and watching the, I, I, and you, you, it feels terrible to be that parent who's sort of getting all the, the burden of the approbation, you know, everyone on the airplane, and it wasn't, uh, airplanes are tough, but, you know, everyone around you expecting, sort of waiting for you to do something and you knowing that, that the something that they, that, that your best choice is to ride this out or even maybe to, you know, what looks like reward the child was, okay, here, why don't you, you know, I know that you're feeling bad, have a lollipop, and we'll talk about this when we get home. And that looks like terrible parenting, yeah. but maybe it's the right thing for you. So anyway, I think that makes that lack of a consensus around what we are supposed to do and what we're expected to do and what the people around us will approve of our doing makes that a really stressful Yeah, and so thing. we second guess mm-hmm. every move that we make. and yeah. Yeah, 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 and we have mental conversations with them. Well, I was, you know, I was just doing that because, yeah, it's, it's, um, it can be really. So that's my thought: is that that is a really stressful area uh-huh. because we're not necessarily, you know, we just don't have an answer. We hate that. We don't like not having answers. Right. I don't and like it. I, I feel. <laughs> I feel like so much of of what you're saying in this book boils down to like just chill the f out. Yeah. A little bit. Right. I'm okay. You're okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, it, it, it really is. We need to just, um, take a step back and take some deep breaths and, uh, look around and notice that we're safe. We're secure. There aren't, you know, most of the things that we think are chasing after our kids, the terrible things that are happening to them, that they're not in the first grade class with their best friend, or they didn't get into the college that they want to. It's not a tiger. It's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's okay. It's going to work out. And once we can, if we can do that, um, we can just be in a much, much nicer place for everybody. Yeah. Did you, are you familiar with Susan David? Yes, I love work. Susan David. Yeah, so she's kind of all about like emotional agility. Yeah, emotional agility, which yeah. is basically you know instilling resilience. I mean, she talks about it within ourselves, mm-hmm. but certainly I think it's important to it, the more you kind of understand about that, it can it can help inform a healthier parenting approach to instill that in, right. in the kids, right? Yeah, no, I think I think it's great, and it's it's just so important to find you know some some perspective on all the things that get us, you know, put our shoulders into our ears and really uh, freak us out. Yeah. So what's, uh, what are you working on now? What's next? You're not doing the, <laughs> are you still writing for the New York Times? Uh, I write for the New York Times sort of when the opportunity arises. I'm not, not a regular columnist anymore and I'm not editing anymore. That was so much fun, but it was time to, to move on. You can't, uh-huh. happier parents don't spend their whole lives writing about parenting. <laughs> Um, actually, what's next for me is fiction. I'm really oh yeah. Wow. I'm uh, cool. I'm moving out of the nonfiction realm for the moment. I've got a novel with my agent, uh, wow. but that may you know may end up in a drawer, and I may start working on the next one. But I'm gonna just work on talking about this book and getting out there and enjoying this experience and sort of having this conversation with as many people as I can right. while I do some different creative things. Yeah, cool. And you host your podcast M writing right the great Jessica Leahy yes I think one of the most it's just on a completely brilliant you know, like personal level one of the most brilliant things that she and I ever did was to create a podcast that wasn't about we you know we both write a lot about parenting and family mm-hmm. creating a podcast that wasn't about that was perhaps the smartest thing because I think you know we we'll we'll both evolve in terms of our journalistic careers but we'll always be writers. Right. So that's what we talk about on our podcast, yeah. writing. Yeah. We can do that when we're 80. It's cool. And how's life on the farm? Life on the farm is yeah. really good. That's, this is a, so you, work at, you live on a farm in New Hampshire. I like live a, on a farm. Like a fully functioning. As, as like, in, let's see, as in they are stacking hay without yeah. me right now. Um, I was when part you say of the they, cutting. As in my kids. Your four kids? Oh, How do you yeah. get them to do that? They have to. They ha- that's it. Yeah. I mean, and that's, right. you know, that's actually the answer to how to get uh-huh. kids to do any chores is, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not, it's not optional in our family, whether or not you go down and stack hay, cause there's hay and 
It has to be stacked. It has to be stacked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I had to I had to get some other people. I mean, we have a barn manager. We we farm with other people and our community comes together to to do that part of it, the haying, but yeah, sort of long distance managing, um, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. But you can't schedule hay. You can't control hay. Hay must be cut when there are enough sunny days to cut the hay. And Uh unfortunately, that coincided with me being in California. Right. So 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 are they doing it? Oh, yeah. In your absence? Oh, yeah. And what's I mean, they have to. It's cut. Like once you've cut it, there are no alternatives to bailing it. <laughs> is this do you do you approach this with the carrot or the stick or some combination thereof? Uh um I will pay you if you are my child to help with the hang if you are doing the work of that I would that an, of an adult. Mm-hmm. So I am now to the point where my youngest kids are 12 and they do get paid a little to to work. Well, two of them do. The one who rides horses and works at the barn and and is very integrally involved with the farm doesn't get paid in money because she gets paid in right sort of you know doing what she loves um and then my 17 year old gets paid a lot more because he's much more useful when it comes to haying than i am he's right. six feet tall and you know can throw a hay bale ba- into a truck whereas i have to like sort of heft it up gently and so, so, so he ca- gets a full man's salary carrot, to do carrots that. Carrots of varying sizes. Carrots of varying yeah. sizes. But, it, you know, they haven't, they haven't always. And there's a lot of farm work that they do that doesn't come with any kind of carrot. It just is what it is. Right. Cool. All right. Well, we got to wrap this up. But let's leave people with um, some inspiration, a little nugget of wisdom for the parent out there that still suffers, for the parent that just can't, they just can't get past uh, the obligations of the day just can't wrap their head around the indulgent idea that they that they that they can and should exercise a little self care. How do we get that person on a better track? Just, I think, knowing if you need this that you are a better parent when you are happier. Um, that it that it cycles around. It goes happier fam- parent, happier kid, happy family, happier parent, happier kid, happier family. And if you need to, I mean, people who spend time on their own happiness, they make better employees. They're healthier. They live longer. Um, there's a lot of research around this that it is worthwhile to put some time into making yourself a positive member of society as well as a contributing member of society. Powerful KJ. Thank you so much. Thank you. Delight to talk to you. How do you feel? You this feel was right? great. Good. Awesome. The book is How to Be a Happier Parent, available everywhere you buy fine books. Is there an audio book? Oh, yeah. And did I read it myself. Voice? Good. I, I awesome. did. I learned a lot from that. reading it. It was yeah. kind of interesting. <laughs> it taught you? Well, I, mean, about, well yes. I learned a lot about, about writing a book and reading an audio book. But also, yes, in rereading the chores chapter, I spent a lot of time going, oh, Oh, we should be doing that. Oh, geez. And uh, then I went home and we made that better. So, yeah. <laughs> I learned in reading my audiobook that it's very difficult to read an audiobook. Oh, very yes. awkward. <laughs> That's what I learned. I learned that I cannot yeah. pronounce the word towards. Towards. T O W A R D. They won't let you say towards? Towards. Yeah, but I can't say that. Oh, you can't? I, yeah. I can say, I would, in conversation, I would say Is that toward. a Texas thing? I, it must be. I would say toward. Uh-huh. I wouldn't say it with the S, but I always wrote it with the S. And then there I was, and I can't tell you how often I use that word. It's just, you know, if ready to shoot This is your biggest myself. problem. You're doing well in yeah, the world. Yeah, I should be happy. Yeah, cool. Um, do you have any, do you, go, do you do public speaking stuff or any book signings or anything like that? Like if people want to f- want to reach out to you, connect with you, how do they do that? Where's the best place to I do it? I am really easy to find, kjdelantonia.com. I do do some speaking, not a whole lot, um, because I live in rural New Hampshire and it's hard, but I do get out there once in a while. And, you know, I'm very active. Like, you can always find me online. Yeah, and listen to our podcast. Please. And please say hi to Jess for me. I'll do that. All right, cool. Come back and talk to me again. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Peace. Peace.